Hello, everybody, and welcome to my talk, my session, How Not to Start with Kubernetes. My name is Christian Hegelmann, and I want to share with you within the next 30 minutes the lessons I've learned running Kubernetes on-prem, so in your own data center. And it might be a little bit boring for you if you're already running Kubernetes, because all the things I will mention are basically beginner yeah, failures, right? Um, so I've split this presentation in two parts, operation and infrastructure, as well as development and deployment stuff. But let's get started. So back in 2018, I was working for another company, uh, which was yeah, uh, um, highly regulated. And one of our architects reached out to us, to um, the operations team, where I was a system engineer, and said, hey, we want to use containers, we want to use container orchestration, and if we can help him um, yeah, running a small POC. And the POC was Kubernetes against, not against, but Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. We want to compare um, um, both of them, both solutions. And as I mentioned, we need to run on-prem. In our case, it was uh, um, based on CentOS, on VMware, and Xen. And it was Kubernetes version 1.9 we started with. And there's already the first little mistake I made or we made. So it was a small POC with a small group of people. But when you are building a platform or starting using a platform like Kubernetes in your company, then you should onboard all other departments as well from the beginning get involved with security, get involved with the data center guys like uh, storage and networking guys, right? Because as mentioned, you're building a little data center within the data center and the platform will be used by, by all of your, your uh, um, developers, all of your operation guys. So do it in a little bigger scope than you expect. And yeah, that's the key takeaway here from, from my perspective. And also, if you have no idea or no experience running Kubernetes, then perhaps you should get external help. There are companies out there, they will take your money and, and say what you should do here, right? So, but let's first start with infrastructure and operation topics. So as I said, our small PUC was really, um, just in my case, a uh, uh, three node Kubernetes cluster. So I provisioned three VMs. I started installing uh, Kubernetes using kubeadm manually with SSH into the boxes, running all the commands, right? And it was working. It was working fine for the first couple of weeks, but then I upgraded to Kubernetes 1.10. This was also still possible. And we hadn't had any storage provision or, or ingress controllers on this little POC cluster. Um, from the beginning. So it was just plain Kubernetes and some uh, um, web applications deployed into it. But later on, when I wanted to upgrade to Kubernetes 1.11, yeah, my upgrade failed and the cluster was in a non-recoverable state. So yeah, this was a little bit not the best thing, right? But, um, and perhaps I could fix it now with my knowledge what I have. But back in the days, the cluster was just that, right? So I switched to Rancher and not installing Kubernetes manually anymore. And Rancher is quite nice. It provides a nice UI. You don't have to think about uh, um, authentication. You can connect it to your AD and so on. And it's quite easy to deploy clusters using Rancher. But there are other options in VMware. If you're running completely entirely on VMware, you can use VMware Tanzu, you can use KubeSpray. There might be a lot of other provisioners out there which you can utilize. But as key takeaway, don't do manual installations, which leads me to my next slide, automation everywhere. So try to automate from the beginning with your first cluster, right? To have a small POC in place, yeah, it might be better just to, to install it uh, um, yeah, manually or using the UI of the different, different tools. But if you need to deploy multiple clusters or you have to provision clusters automatically um, 
to spin up a cluster for for development group which will then being destroyed after then everything should be automated from the beginning right so take or invest the time in, in automation have an cisd process in place to to automatically uh, provision clusters and document as well from the beginning so don't skip this step document everywhere so people are uh, um, yeah, able to deploy clusters even without your help, right? So next, a little bit more into details with networking. So network CNI and configuration. There are plenty of network CNIs available. These are only listed a few of them, like Calico, Flannel, Weave, Canals, Cilium. And so the network CNI is a really crucial thing you need to, to think about before you're starting it or starting using Kubernetes. Which network CNI should you use? And as well, which side arrange, for instance, for your port and service network you want to use? So in my case, I had here a little bit of an issue. So when provisioning clusters with Rancher, Rancher will have the default um, subnet range for port and service network 1043 and 1042. Yeah, but this was colliding with one of our offices. And yeah, the cluster was running fine. And then when people from the office actually want to access services on the clusters, they couldn't because, as I said, we had here a little bit of an overlapping. I was able to mitigate this problem by adding a five full reverse proxy in front of the workload. But still, think about stuff like that when you're installing your network scene, right? Another thing I stumbled across was network policies. So in my first cluster I was provisioning was basically in the example flannel listed as, as a CNI provider, right? And it was working great. It was working fine. And I also used flannel then for my first cluster I provisioned in Rancher. But flannel is not able to, to utilize network policies or enforce network policies. So one day I wanted to isolate network traffic uh, from one of my namespaces, and it wasn't, yeah, I wasn't able to do this. And also, Ranger wasn't able to change the network scene I after the cluster creation. You can do this, yeah, with, with other provisioners or, or with a vanilla cluster, for instance, but with Ranger, we were stuck here with, with Flannel, at least on this one development cluster. Then you need to think about, do I want to encrypt data in transit and not using a service mesh, for instance? Then you can run, uh, I think Calico is able to offer this and WeaveNet um, as well. And know at least the basics like, like DNS, how DNS is being done in Kubernetes, right? And how to resolve service names within Kubernetes that you're not going, if you I've seen workload configured using or, or wanted to request yeah, a, a service next running in the same namespace, but going through the entire ingress controller to, to reach the service instead of just calling the service name inside of the cluster, right? But speaking of um, ingresses, that was the next question after my first POC cluster. So how we could reach our services inside of the cluster. And yeah, I, I was also, I had no experience. Right, so, so I was reading through documentations or examples, and I ended up with deploying a metal LB inside of our cluster and using traffic as an ingress controller. I had a single traffic ingress controller running, and we split our traffic for external and internal using um, allow lists. But this is error prone, so a developer could forget to add an allow list to its, to its ingress annotation and that perhaps your ingress will be exposed to the internet by accident, right? So perhaps it would be better here to have a separate ingress controller for, for external and internal workloads. And also in our case, perhaps it would be a better idea to put our existing F5 in front of the, of the ingress controller instead of using MATLAB, reusing the stuff you already own right or you already have in, in, in your in your environment and then you have to think about security do i want to add network uh, web application firewall in front on the load balancer level in aws you can enable and WAF on your load balancer i could reuse my f5 WAF if i would use 
a five for my for my load balancer, right? Um, you can use on ingress uh, level, like in nginx, you can uh, use mod security, for instance, right? So think about security in advance, as well as how do we want to manage SL certificates? A very convenient way is using Cert Manager with Let's Encrypt, but you don't want to end up with yeah, deploying certificates manually with kubectl apply and taking care of renewing your certificates after two years, right? So, so you will forget it. Give me, uh, trust me, you will forget sometimes to renew your certificates in specific namespace or whatever. And then you probably will have a, a short outage, right? So the next thing I want to, to cover here, um, so a developer reached out to us or to me and said, hey, we need to store some files in our cluster and our workloads. And I said, uh, okay, uh, I have no idea. Um, I need to, to do some research here, what, what I need to do. And he said, yeah, I already found something in the internet. And um, yeah, it was basically in, in, uh, a manual how to install Heketi with cluster and FS inside of your cluster. And we were, yeah, just following the guides, following the uh, instructions. But what was happening after that every time I was upgrading Kubernetes, the version, and the Kubelet service was restarted on the node, all the mounts were failing. So, so I have to restart all the services to get my workload yeah, back online. Right? And this was, again, something what was yeah, a problem with Rancher because there was a missing extra mount uh, um, or extra bind missing on the Kubelet service, which was yeah, causing this issue. And as we don't had so much IOP, uh, IOPS uh, intensive workload, it was really just some, some uh, files dropping in a in, 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 in folder, I switched to a plain old simple NFS client provision. So if you want to, to yeah, introduce some, some storage backend, perhaps you should also ask your, your storage guys what they can provision, or perhaps they have already some solutions for you, right? And you also need to think about, okay, how I'm doing backups for my persistent volumes, if you want to, if there are files in it you really need, right? So backup, what kind of workload do you expect? what your infrastructure is already providing. So you need to take some time to, to research what you really need to, to implement here in your cluster. The next thing I want to bring up, RBAC or authentication authorization, role-based access control, use service accounts from the beginning. One of the mistakes I did is after my, my first development cluster, I just hand it over to the developer uh, a an, an token with um, cluster admin rights, right? And this token was being reused by a lot of people and it shouldn't be here the case, right? So, so this was one of the, the problems that we, it was really hard after to get rid of the token because I was using it with in cube config files within the pipelines and so on. So don't share credentials across teams have separate accounts for deployment, monitoring, operation tasks. Everybody should have its own user and so on. So it can also lock down which resources different departments can access within the cluster, right? The next topic I want to cover is logging monitoring. Sounds obvious, right? But having the proper monitoring in place, it's also crucial. So don't just monitor your, your services you deployed inside of your cluster. You should really also monitor the infrastructure. So on node level, the cluster services like um, your HD database, the API server latency, um, DNS services running in the cluster, right? Kubernetes events should be also covered by your monitoring, like OM kills, crash loop backup events. The actual requested and used resources is also a thing you, you should decide or, or you should monitor with your, with your stack. And the funniest question I always was being asked by developers was basically, hey, 
where in my pod should I write my log file to? Because every time I'm redeploying my pod, my log file is gone. And this was one thing you were always telling them, yeah, you, but you don't write log files, you write to standard out, then our Fluent D process will grab the log files and forward it to Splunk. And here in Splunk, you can now see all the logs of your pods and, and be happy with that, right? So, so log monitoring is also really crucial. And there are plenty of open source uh, um, solutions out there like Prometheus in combination with Grafana, Elk stack for, for logging and so on. So take your time, invest the time to set up a proper logging and monitoring for your clusters here. So the next topic, I was being pinged one morning that, hey, Christian, all ingresses are down, not working anymore. Everything is, is completely uh, uh, down. Please help, please help, please help. And then I recognized when I checked the latest ingresses which were deployed to our clusters that one of the ingresses has no um, host name defined. And so what the ingress controller was then doing it, it or, or, or yeah, this was doing, it was uh, um, interpreting the missing host field with an asterisk. And so all workload was then being yeah, routed to the one service behind this ingress annotation. But you can prevent such errors in advance with um, tools like with policies, cluster policies. And there are plenty of tools out there. The most popular are Caverno and Open Policy Agent. And yeah, deploy cluster policies from the beginning so that no workload will will being deployed even on the dev clusters without the proper validation, like the ingress validation I told you, like pod security, for instance, this low privilege containers, uh, that your deployment requires some resource limits and requests defined, right? That there are health checks configured within your, within your service. So start with policies straight away. And the last thing I want to mention in operations and infrastructure tasks is, yeah, it's, I titled the, the slide cube cut control, cube cuddle, or cube CTL, however you want to pronounce it. But operators and developers should at least be familiar with common cube CTL commands, right? Like get pod, logs, uh, um, describe pod, and so on. Um, I've seen a lot of people were struggling when, for instance, the uh, web UI from, from Rancher was not available. And they were not able to troubleshoot deployment issues, right? And and these are the basics you should yeah be aware of, and also invest again in trainings here to to yeah that the people are familiar with the tools. So next will be already development and deployment stuff. So running workload in Kubernetes because of the wrong motivation. I've seen this multiple times when, when you ask somebody, hey, why you yeah, deployed this application in our Kubernetes cluster? Then yeah, you're getting answers like, I run it in Kubernetes because I don't want to request a VM. There are other examples like uh, we had Puppet and Hira. So uh, for, for config management in our uh, company back in the days, and people used to deploy stuff in Kubernetes because they want to skip the merge request in, in our Puppet configuration. That's also not the way how to decide why to run workload in Kubernetes, right? Or something like running a static website inside of a pod instead of just putting that in a three bucket. Right? Think about why the workload should run in Kubernetes. If it makes sense, there should be the architects who decide what kind of workload to put in which environment or in, in, yeah, if it should run in Kubernetes or not. The next one, local development. A lot of time I've seen something, so I'm getting pinged like Kubernetes is down. My deployment is not working yet, right? And you were checking the deployment and you had a lot of uh, um, restarts of the container. Then you pull the container to your local computer and, and just run a Docker start on the container and you see the container wasn't starting at all. So developers should be familiar or, or when they're working on Kubernetes should at least testing their containers on their local machine. There are 
multiple options to run a Kubernetes on your local machine, like Kubernetes and Docker, Minikube, Keys. So you can also test your deployment. I've seen a lot of people who are building Helm charts and then having a Git commit history, hundreds of, of, of commits just to test their Helm deployment. You don't need to run every time an entire CI CD pipeline to just test out your Helm chart. This couldn't be done locally faster, in my opinion. So get familiar with local development, local development tools, and, and yeah, just use them. Then one of the yeah, main reasons deployments were failing or, or CICD's pipelines are failing were um, they were using latest tags. And I can tell you never ever use latest tags either in your CICD pipeline nor in your Kubernetes deployment. So it could break your entire workload if it's getting rebuild your image with, let's, let's assume you are building a Node.js application, you're using uh, Node latest, right? Then all of a sudden it could be that, yeah, Node.js is releasing a new, new version and your um, application is not compatible anymore with the newest Node.js version. And then it will build with the newest uh, uh, base image and will break basically your workload, right? So try to avoid at least the latest takes. One of the problems I had with Akiti, a storage provisioner, was, for instance, that in the example I was uh, using to, to install a Hikiti in clusterfs, Hikiti was deployed using latest. And every time Hikiti was rescheduled, it was pulling the newest image. And then we had a version discrepancy between clusterfs and Hikiti, right? And yeah, this was also one of bigger problem because we weren't able to provision any persistent volumes anymore, right? So please don't use latest. But talking of images, private registry and base images. I think it's really crucial to have a library of own base images and an own registry in your environment, private registry, where you have full control over the images, where you can scan your images for vulnerabilities, so, so for instance, Harbor, it's an open source uh, um, registry. You can use it and, and just scan your images constantly. You can add additional configuration to the base images. Uh, Java 8 was there, for instance, one, one example. Um, no need to pull everything from Docker Hub and hit the rate limit, right? And then don't use the image pull policy always. So there, there are some use cases uh, image pull policy always is usable or, or good, but normally you don't want to pull the image every time um, it's getting rescheduled on another worker node if the image is already there, because it will be much more faster to spin up your application, right? If it's just reusing the image which is already cached on the machine. And if possible, use block and allow lists for your developers. You don't want to have something like this um, in the screenshot below, Docker pull from some untrusted sources perhaps with a crypto miner in it. So I've seen people using from really untrusted sources or not known sources, images like Alpine curl. Like why not just yeah, building your own Alpine image with curl included if, if needed, right? So, and another problem I've seen frequently was not using the power of Kubernetes or like this quote says, why auto-scaling, I have two pods. So when you just deploy two pods or, or one pod of your, of your application, why just run it in, in Kubernetes when you don't use yeah, the features of Kubernetes, what Kubernetes is offering you here? Like, as I said, auto-scaling, very cool stuff, right? So use just the features Kubernetes is yeah, offering you. Other problem in, in development lifecycle, health checks. So make sure your application is configured with a proper health check, please. And prevent, again, you can use Kverno or Open Policy Agent to prevent applications being deployed to your cluster without a proper health check, liveness check, readiness probe or whatever, right? And if you get ever getting asked, 
hey, please restart my container or my, my application in Kubernetes. Then you have to ask the developer, okay, why we need to restart it manually? This shouldn't be the, the way you work in Kubernetes. Your service should recover automatically and, and restart automatically, right? So proper health check in place is, is really, really crucial. Forgotten resource limits and requests. So I've seen a lot of yeah, deployments which haven't had defined any resource limits and resource requests in their application. So what you can do against something like that, again, you can yeah, prevent workload at this with the policies, or you can add just default requests and, and, and limits based on namespace or cluster limit. And a question I was getting asked quite frequently was, yeah, but I don't know how many resources my, my application is using. So you can reference here again back to the local development section. So just run your image locally and then you will directly see how much, how much resources your image is consuming. And if not so, I've seen, for instance, small microservices written in Go and they just requested 12 CPUs and 128 gigs of memory. Then you should also ask the developer, hey, isn't it perhaps a little bit much because Kubernetes will try to reserve the requested memory on the worker node and is also trying to schedule your application based on your uh, uh, resource request. So monitoring such things is also yeah, beneficial. The next thing I want to talk about is environment variables for configuration and secrets. You can totally put some configuration volumes in, in environment variables, but I've seen also deployments with, I don't know, 50, 60 different environment variables for, for configuration. So use config maps for configuration, right? And never ever put secrets in plain text into environment variables. So, Create and standard how your application should be configured, right? And use a secret store. For instance, you can use Vault or you can use some stuff like sealed secrets from Bitnami, which make the things more in yeah, more secure. And Kubernetes secrets are not encrypted in, in your cluster, right? So if you can read a secret with your service account or your user account, you can just run a, a base 4060 code and you will have the value of the secret. So keep that in mind. Also, when you're creating service accounts that you not yeah, allow them to read all secrets. So, and one of the yeah, last slides, um, using a template engine or Helm. So, so what I've seen in our environment that people are reusing the same YAML files for deployment, for, for ingresses and for service annotations, uh, for services over and over again. And it makes something, yeah, it makes really hard to change all these, yeah, deployment and, and all the YAML files in different Git repositories. If you want to introduce something like a new annotation, if you want to, add some, some uh, monitoring annotations to your um, application and so on. So provide perhaps a Helm template for your developers, which they can use because most of the deployments in our organization were most or likely the same, right? And I create a Helm template they can use and then also just yeah, having switches inside of the template like expose my service externally, yes or no, do you want to have a persistent volume, yes or no. They don't need to think about storage classes, they don't need to think about uh, uh, ingress configuration, it's just a matter of the template and the developer could then easily just deploy in its CI CD pipeline the application by using uh, a Helm upgrade install providing the image uh, uh, um, the image URL and the image tag, setting some more parameters and they were good to go and they can deploy the application to Kubernetes. So this was for us or for me a huge time saver. So, and as summary of my talk is, 
when you're starting your journey in Kubernetes in your, in your company, invest in trainings. If you have no idea, like I had back in the days, um, invest in trainings, document how to use the platform. Documentation is, is, is here also the key um, to not run into the same issues over and over again, right? To give the developers and the operation team guidance on how to use Kubernetes, how to use the platform. I provide templates to avoid common mistakes like the forgotten health checks and so on. And try to reject everything as early as possible, which is not, yeah, meet the required standards of your, of your um, deployments. Right? So again, stuff like using the policy engines and involve your security operations from the beginning and involve all other teams from the beginning, right? As I said, you're building here a really huge platform which is being used by all of the people in your organization later on. So that's all from my side. And yeah, I'm, I'm happy um, to be here available for some Q&A sessions, right? Um, you can reach out to me via LinkedIn, on Twitter, or shoot me an email. And we will see us, I hope, you enjoyed the session and see you later in the Q&A. Bye-bye.